Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jill Marsteller and I'm an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health with a joint appointment at the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine within the School of Medicine. I have a PhD in health services research and my work concentrates on organizational behavior and uh, work in teams. Today I'm here to talk to you about building your team for the On the Cusp Stop BSI project. So our module today will describe why building a team is not nearly as simple as people think it is. Today you're going to take away with you uh, an understanding of the central importance of your ICU quality improvement team. And in addition, you will develop a strategy for building a successful team. What do I mean when I'm talking about the quality improvement team? The core team that's working on the CUSP CLABSI project, I mean the smaller group that is spreading the intervention across the rest of the ICU. I want you to really understand the importance of the quality improvement team. Why is it, if you stop and think, why is it that the team would matter so much to outcomes? Give that a moment's thought. The reason is because your quality improvement team has virtually absolute power over how the local implementation of this program goes. Now obviously there are things that you can't control. Um, however, you are the ones who decide how the rest of the unit is going to be educated on the activities, whether the unit is engaged in this process, how your team executes the actual project, and how the unit, therefore, executes the project. And so, you can see that if the quality improvement team doesn't do a good job, then it's quite possible that the team's outcomes and the outcomes of the entire project will be impaired as a result. So, stop and think for a moment, what do you think makes a good team? Well, I'm going to put it to you that it's the who on the team and the how. Let's consider how we produce outcomes of a team. I'm going to offer you a simple model of inputs, processes, and outputs. The inputs include the environment, the hospital and the unit context, the team, the quality improvement team's composition, and then the design of the task. The processes are the processes that occur inside the team, outside the team, and then the traits that the team develops. Now the team traits are things about the team that are characteristics that are not really associated with any single member of the team, but rather describe the team as a whole. And then these lead to outputs. So these include your performance overall, attitudes, and behaviors. The real piece that we're going to talk about a lot today is the team composition. This is one of the inputs to the processes that lead to the outputs uh, that you have a lot of control over. And I want everyone to consider this carefully in a strategic way as opposed to simply approaching it from the perspective that, well, Bob doesn't seem to have a lot to do, so he probably could work on this project. And Sally, well, she seems to always want to run everything, so we should probably include her. And of course, Sarah's new. So maybe we shouldn't keep her, you know, bring her in too because, you know, she needs to get to know people. Well, that's not the way that we want you to approach creating your team. We want you to take a strategic approach that will set you up to succeed. So let's look at team composition and start with the idea of the size of the team. How big do you want this team to be? Chances are good that someone in upper management has tapped someone. You're the someone because you're listening to this lecture and you've been tapped to put together this team or you've been told go do it okay so it's up to you now to decide who's going to be helping you to do this when you contemplate your team you don't want it to be too small if you've only got a few people on your team then it's very hard to get all the work done there's a lot of work involved here you have to keep doing your regular work in addition to this work and so you want to make sure that there are enough actual bodies to get the work done there is one team that I worked with in the Adventist Health System where they had two team members. And those two people, bless their hearts, did a wonderful job. 
but at the end of the collaborative told me that they dearly wished they had had more people to help them get all of that work done. They didn't have enough resources in terms of their own time to really feel that they had done as good a job as they wanted to do. On the other hand, you don't want your team to be too large. Um, there are coordination difficulties when your team is reaching 14 people. In research that I've done previously, the optimal number of people on a team was approximately 10. I think for this project, I would recommend anywhere between 5 and 8 on your core team that is really running this intervention. If the team gets too large, then meetings become a nightmare. People don't have an opportunity to offer their own opinions. People will start to slack off because there's a lot of anonymity on a large team. And typically, if especially if it's coupled with a lack of role clarity, people will assume that other individuals are going to get this done and start to slack off. And you can't have any member of your team slacking off, and I'll tell you why in, in a few slides. The other thing you want to consider with your team composition is having a multidisciplinary representation. This is absolutely essential. You need ICU nurses and physicians. You want someone from infection control. You want the medical director and nurse manager of the ICU and the nurse educator. Those are the people that we absolutely feel that you need to engage. In addition to that, you need to have your executive partner, and that person may not come to absolutely every one of your internal team meetings, but that person needs to be highly engaged. We recommend someone at the VP level or above because they need to be someone who is able to pull resources into your efforts and be able to support you in an effective way. You may want to consider including a pharmacist, hospital patient safety officer, staff from the safety quality or risk management office, respiratory therapists. And let me just comment that, you know, this project is not just about stopping BSI. The reason we call it on the cusp is because there are other safety issues that you're going to be addressing during the course of this project. It's how you keep the staff engaged with what you're doing. And so some of these issues may need a pharmacist. Some of these issues may need the opinion of a respiratory therapist as well. And so these people are going to turn out to be important resources for your work, especially in the cusp area. When you're building your team, it's absolutely essential that you have a team leader. If you don't have a team leader, things are not going to get done. There will be a long pause when you get to the second stage of group development. You may have heard of the stages of group development as being forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. Well, that storming period is an extended one in cases where a team leader has not been designated early in the process because people struggle for that leadership role. And while it may not always lead to fisticuffs, there's nevertheless jockeying for position as the people who are natural leaders on the team seek to find what their role is going to be. So it's better to have someone designated up front who is the team leader and who is fully cognizant of the kinds of things that they are going to need to do as a team leader. You also want to have champions. Now these champions may or may not be the team leader. We'd like to have one who, who represents nursing and one who represents uh, the physicians. The champion is the person who really cares about this issue, who will be personally disappointed and affronted if your success is not complete, who is willing to put in all the extra time necessary to make it happen. So you have to have a person who's a champion. There's a ton of research out there that supports um, having a champion. The lack of a champion can often be the demise of a project. In addition, you want to give some thought to who are the local opinion leaders within your unit. It's important to try to pull these people in. The reason is that these are the folks that people go to when they have a question about something. And they're not necessarily formal opinion leaders. They may be informal opinion leaders. Who is it that you go to ask questions, uh, especially when you feel a little sheepish about the question and you're concerned that other people wouldn't understand? Who's that accessible person whose opinion you very much trust? If you feel that way, find out, in addition, who do other people look to as the opinion leaders? The reason you want these folks on your team is because they're very persuasive with the group. They can lead the group towards the kinds of behaviors you want them to show. And in addition to that, it's very damaging to have an opinion leader 
who is against your project operating outside of your team to undermine it. And so you want to be sure that you've engaged the opinion leaders. And then you want some people with diverse opinions. So that means that when you tell everyone we're going to do a BSI reduction project, you're going to have those people who say, really? Great. You know, that's such a problem. We really need to take care of it. Yes, you want those people on your team. You're also going to have the people who say, oh, great. One more thing that I have to do. You want those people on your team, too. The reason you do is because that attitude is real. That attitude is out there. And so it's better for you to have someone on the team who started with that attitude so that you can understand it, you can anticipate it, and you can overcome it in the rest of the group. Now let's talk about some personality traits that you might want to look for when you're building your team. You want someone gregarious. Why is that? Well, they make the meetings a whole lot more fun. But in addition to that, when you have your face-to-face -face meetings, these are the people who are going around meeting everybody else on every other team and tapping their knowledge, asking them, hey, what did you try? And wow, that sounds great. And how did you do that? And can I get your contact information? This kind of thing really tends to build a sense of community with your peers who are also working on this project. And it ensures that you secure for yourself the important information that other teams have learned and that you can benefit from everyone's learning, not just your own team's learning. You also want someone who can see the big picture. You need someone who can look at how the implementation or rollout is going and can figure out what some of the barriers are from a very systematic perspective, who can look at the problems that you're going to have in the future and help you plan ways to prevent that from being an impassable barrier. On the other side of that, though, is that you need someone who's detail-oriented. Not everybody who is a big picture or big idea person actually puts the pencil to the paper. You need people who are very detail-oriented, who are going to give a lot of thought about where should we put the poster? Where will people spend most of their time? Where will people be able to access that poster? How exactly are we going to craft this email? So make sure that you've got people who are detail-oriented as well as people who see the big picture. And then finally, everyone needs to be dedicated to this work. This is going to be a lot of effort. You don't want to come to the end of the project and feel that your effort was in vain. You certainly don't want to uh, have slow progress that results in continued lives lost. And so everyone needs to be dedicated to what you're trying to get done. So let's talk about some of the characteristics that successful teams have. In our previous research, we've noted that successful teams have reliable processes. What does this mean for you? It means that you need to have well-planned education and engagement activities, that you need to have given a lot of consideration into how you are going to share this intervention with everyone on your unit. Good communication methods within the team, among all of the members of the team, and with all of your external audiences, including the people on the unit and the senior leaders and uh, of both the hospital and of the board or the system that you might be part of. Good teams also tend to have leadership support and buy-in. If you feel that the leader that's been assigned to you, if a person has been assigned as opposed to your selecting that individual, then you need to talk to them carefully about what is involved and try to if necessary, find someone who is willing to put in the time if that leader can't. You also want to note that successful teams have conflict. And I do mean that. We need those people of diverse opinions to come together in a safe forum to share their diverse opinions. They need to be able to each say, I don't agree with that. I feel that that strategy is weak in the following way. That will never work because of this. And you need to have that kind of interplay of opinion in order to achieve the best solution. The more alternative solutions you consider, the higher quality your eventual decision will be. So you do want some conflict. It cannot be a conflict fest, however. It, conflict can't be the end. Conflict can't be the end game. You need to achieve conflict resolution. You have to enter a period of convergent opinion as well as that period of divergent opinion. So you need the team to be able to come together on a plan 
after having an open conflict period where things were considered and then the diverse opinions were resolved into one plan. Successful teams also develop their own norms. These are the traits of the team that I mentioned before. For example, a successful team values the individual contributions of its members and expects individual contributions from every member. Remember, every person on that team has a slightly different perspective, a different viewpoint on the problem, or a different frame of reference because their work is slightly different, in addition to their personal characteristics being slightly different. And so, you want to be sure that you're gathering every piece of relevant information, not leaving out anyone's individual contribution. There needs to be cohesion on the team. There, the team needs to feel like a team. The team needs to be able to say, we are working together to prevent infection. There needs to be goal agreement. And not just on, yes, we are eliminating bloodstream infections, but goal agreement at a, at a uh, smaller level as well. We are going to get the plan for BSI reduction out by the end of February so that everyone knows that that's the task you're working on and everyone knows that's what you're trying to get done and can put their efforts toward reaching that goal. In addition, the team needs to have a strong self-assessment of its own knowledge and skills. And this can be difficult. If you feel that your team does not self-assess its knowledge and skills well, then you need to find a way to go out and get that knowledge and skills that you need. Teams that are more confident of their own knowledge and skills and quality improvement tended to implement more changes to improve quality in recent studies that we did. The references for those studies are at the end of this presentation. And in addition, you want to make sure that all of your team members are participating. There's nothing that can create resentment on a team like one person who's not doing anything. That's part of the reason why you want to stay away from a team that's too large. You also want to make sure that everyone is engaged. You can't afford to have one person on the team doing nothing, not only because of the resentment it creates in others, but because that means that person is not engaged. That person, for whatever reason, is not sharing what they know, and we can't afford to have that lack of information. So participation of everyone is crucial. And then let me say that you need to have role clarity on your team as well. If the team is not clear, members of the team are not clear on what exactly they're supposed to be doing, there will be this jockeying, there will be people avoiding responsibility and other difficulties because of a lack of understanding about exactly what each person is supposed to do. So in your meetings you need to come up with action plans where tasks are clearly assigned. A good way to start is by having everybody on the team early in your work together say what they envision their own role to be, what they feel they are supposed to be doing. And let me say that this is where every team member has the opportunity to be a leader. And every team leader must remember that they are a team member as well. Every person's personality, every person's foibles affect how the team gets along, how the team progresses. And so everyone needs to be clear on what their role is so that they can go to do a good job on that. But everyone also needs to be aware that they are called upon to lead as a role model and be a good team member regardless of what their position is on the team. So your action items from this module are first to go out and form your team with an appreciation of the importance of who is on your team. And remember, I can't overemphasize how important this is. If you end up with a team that is made up of Bob, who has nothing to do, Sally, who always runs everything, and Sarah, who's new, um, you may not have the outcomes that you're looking for in this project. Don't underestimate the importance of selection of this team. And then I want you to carefully plan how you're going to act as a unified group. This is not a five-minute activity. This is the group getting together and talking about uh, what they want expectations to be and who's planning on doing what and what are the goals of this group. Who's our leader? Whose cues do we take? And then I want you to do a pre-mortem assessment. So if this project were to fail, why would it? From the perspective of the quality improvement team, what could the QI team have done differently to prevent failure? So even though it hasn't happened yet, 
I want you to try to think about what the barriers are that you're going to come across and what you can do to defeat those barriers. So in closing, I put up the references that I used in preparing today's module, and I thank you very much for your time.